name is Jeff Powers. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Occipital. We work on computer vision software and hardware uh, to enable mixed and augmented reality. And uh, today we're going to talk about the commoditization of positional tracking. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. First, I'll tell you guys a little bit about the company. We're about 40 people now. We have major offices in San Francisco and in Boulder, Colorado. We have some great uh, investor backers, such as Foundry Group, Intel Capital, uh, Grishin Robotics, and others. One of the kind of fun, interesting facts about Occipital is one of the ways that we grew our company, in, amongst, you know, in addition to regular recruiting and hiring, is through acquisitions. So we've actually acquired uh, three major small companies throughout our history. We acquired a company called ManCTL that had a product called Skinect, Lynx Laboratories, which was kind of a friend competitor in the RGBD scanning space, and Replica Labs, which was working on monocular uh, reconstruction and tracking. So, and our, company's, our team has worked on some cool stuff in the past as well. Uh, so you might have heard of us, if you've heard of Occipital, probably it's because of the structure sensor, which is probably our currently most well-known product. It's that attachment there that's attached to the iPad. It's also sitting on top of that headset in the middle. Uh, basically, we do build 3D vision hardware. So back in 2011, we raised money to go after augmented reality. We were going to build this amazing engine. And we looked at the cameras and that were available on the devices that were out. And we said, these aren't good enough. We need to do something about it. And so we decided to build hardware. That led to the introduction of Structure Sensor. In December, we introduced Bridge, which is a mixed reality headset that uses an iPhone. If you haven't checked it out, it's pretty cool. We have a demo here at the show. And then recently, we've also uh, began introducing an embeddable 3D module called Structure Core. But today, we're not going to talk really about our hardware. We're going to talk about software for positional tracking. Uh, but first, the Toyota Corolla. <laughs> I'm sure you guys came to this talk just especially to hear about the Toyota Corolla. If not, you should probably leave now. Uh, in 1969, the Toyota Corolla was introduced to the US market uh, amongst uh, competitors like the Oldsmobile. The Corolla was a different kind of car than the Oldsmobile and other popular cars at the time. It was simpler. It was lighter. Uh, it couldn't fit as much stuff, uh, but it was more efficient as a result. It didn't have as many parts, uh, which meant it didn't have as many features, but it didn't break as much as a result. And at first, it was out of taste with the American consumer. But over time, uh, the Corolla you know, took off because people realized it got them from point A to B. It did what they needed. It was efficient in doing so. It didn't require as many fancy parts. And, uh, and frankly, it did a really good job at this. It was very efficient. Uh, it didn't break as much. And so five years later, um, the Corolla yeah, so fewer parts, smaller, less things to break. Uh, five years later, the Corolla was the most uh, best-selling car in the world, actually. And uh, since then, it's gone through several iterations and upgrades. And at this point, uh, 40 million Corollas have been sold. And Corolla was one of the major cars that sort of commoditized access to automobiles. Uh, people were buying new Corollas instead of older, larger, you know, used cars. What happened to the Oldsmobile? The Oldsmobile is dead. Um, it shut down in 2000 due to declining sales and changing tastes of consumers. It was just too complex, too big, too inefficient. And so this is an interesting uh, story. Uh, and I'll explain later why it matters in the context, I think, of positional tracking for, for AR VR. So you probably came to hear really about this, positional tracking. Uh, so positional tracking has undergone some evolutions in the last few years. We actually, at Occipital, started working on positional tracking a while back. And one of the first major positional tracking things that we introduced uh, was something that we called uh, unbounded positional tracking, which we announced in 2015. And here's a little video of that working on an, on an iPad. This, was, you know, this tech was pre-things like Tango and stuff like that. So, Check out what you could do with unbounded positional tracking.
So these are a set of cool six off gestures and interactions and movements throughout a scene. You can move your device through the scene. You can walk instead of you know, clicking to navigate. Um, and you can use position to do cool things like pour fluids out of a cup and pick up objects and throw them and things like that. So this is some of our work in positional tracking. But in the VR world, positional tracking really started to take off uh, with the introduction of the popular new consumer VR headsets. But even before that, you had systems like WorldViz working on these outside-in base station solutions to provide positional tracking. You had uh, some crazy looking things like this product in 2013 that I hadn't heard of until recently. Um, you know, they had great positional tracking in 2013 if you wanted to look crazy. Uh, there was what Valve started working on in 2014, which you know, eventually led to the, the Vive and Lighthouse. Um, and uh, you had things, of course, like Oculus's Crystal Cove, which led to the DK2, which provided some small positional tracking for VR in a small region. You had things like, of course, the Lighthouse from, from Valve uh, and HTC, and which has kind of set the standard for VR positional tracking at the moment. And, um, but then things started to change a little bit. And the HoloLens was introduced in 2016, and for the first time had slam-based or camera-based positional tracking that actually started to rival some of these systems that required complex installations. But really, until the HoloLens, nothing really worked that well. Uh, and then Oculus came out with their upgraded positional tracking system. But the question and the subject of this talk is kind of more like, where do we go from here? Um, and that's what I want to talk about next. First, like I said, SLAM is starting to emerge as a competitor uh, to base station-based tracking. I probably don't need to argue this too much to, to you guys, but we really think that it's essentially going to take over, and that's going to be the way that you do positional tracking in the future. Uh, and you're probably not going to have base stations anymore. And there's a few reasons uh, that we believe that. One is you don't have to set up base stations, which is much more amenable for mobile situations. If you're wake, you know, bringing your device to a conference, you can use it immediately. You don't have to set up the room. If you're taking it to a friend's house, you can use it immediately without setup. Of course, you can already do this with mobile VR, but you usually don't have six DOF. Uh, it's one cool fact of slam-based tracking is if you have a friend next to you and you guys have a Wi-Fi connection, you could quite easily share a slam map of the environment. Sort of like you know, in the Wikitude talk, uh, we heard about you, know, you can you know, scan an object and then track against that later. Well, you could scan an environment and track with your friend immediately. So slam lets you do that. Base stations could, but you'd have to set them up everywhere. And lastly, you get something very cool which is you kind of get obstacle awareness for free with SLAM. You don't have to go around and set up the perimeter of your space. If you've set up um, you know, a Rift or, or, uh, or, a, or a Vive, you, you know you have to tell it where you can and can't go. You get all this uh, with SLAM-based tracking for free. OK, cool. So SLAM-based tracking is great. Why don't we have it everywhere all the time? Why do we still have base stations? The reason for that is that it's actually really hard. It's kind of expensive. It uses a lot of compute. So you know, we know this because we've tried to solve a lot of these problems, but there's really no margin for error in these algorithms. Unlike a lot of other kinds of software where you can get it kind of right and then ship a beta and then just work on it, um, you can't really do that with positional tracking because people will just get sick. They'll stop using it. They won't adopt it. So there's really no margin for error. It's a very unforgiving problem. It's also expensive. Um, a lot of the ways that we solve some of these problems today and get a pretty good solution is by adding more cameras or maybe adding lasers and adding other things that make the problem in software a little bit easier but trade off expense, complexity, more parts, more things that can break. Uh, and they use a lot of compute. If you're going to be feeding in three or maybe four or five cameras, that actually just right there uses a bunch of compute. And you have to start to look to custom ASIC chips and other ways to deal with all of that additional data flowing through your system. And so these are the reasons we believe that SLAM tracking hasn't, isn't pervasive. And so we looked at this. And we, by the way, we sell some of the hardware for this that has all these fancy cameras and lasers and all this different stuff. And one of the things we realized is people aren't necessarily ready to, to take the plunge and, and build that kind of thing into their system. So can we bring SLAM to a wider audience by solving some of these problems? 
And that's what we set out recently uh, to try to do. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, what we came up with. But we started out with the system that we sell on the market, we've been using for years, which is essentially an RGBD system, where we have dense depth from infrared cameras and a projector. We have a fisheye camera. We have an IMU. We have an ASIC on board that does a bunch of extra compute. But when you add all these parts up, it's a complex system, like I said. So how can we get simpler? So let's get rid of a laser. Let's get rid of one of the cameras. Let's see what we have. We have a stereo system. This may be a stereo fisheye system and an IMU. This is a cool design because we know it works, because this is what people use uh, every day. And it's a really cool, nice system. And it's a lot cheaper than the other type of system that I described. But if you could go even further, you might even be able to get positional tracking into even more devices. Because even two cameras on some systems is a little costly. So could you get by with a single camera and a single IMU? If you could do this, uh, we think it would be a huge one-eyed monocular success for the market. Uh, and some people have worked on this. We've seen some things. There was, there was some stuff at, at CES earlier this year. There was cool stuff from Qualcomm. And we're, the market's starting to make some progress in this. But generally, everything we've seen has some problems. It has, in many cases, jitter. It has drift. You'll just fly 10 feet into the air. Um, and you don't really know where anything is around you. So you're likely to run into something, which isn't safe, especially if you want to do VR on a mobile device where you're going to be walking around. You want to be safer. So can we solve some of these problems? And I'm going to introduce today something exciting, something new that we're showing for the first time at AWE today. Um, you guys are going to be the first to, to see this video. We're actually announcing this today. We haven't announced it before. Uh, and then starting tomorrow, we're going to have it on display here at the show. But it's occipital tracking, we're calling it for now. And it's actually occipital monocular tracking. So we have tracking already. We've been doing that for a while. It's RGBD based. We use depth. We use color together. But what can we do with mono? And so this is going to be a demo of what our system now looks like, monocular tracking. So this is one camera and one IMU, and that's it. To make it a little easier, the camera is a fisheye camera, uh, and it's global shutter, but it's still quite cost effective. So here's how the system works. It's mono, so you actually move a little bit to teach the system about your environment. But it's just a few seconds. And while you're doing this, the system's actually recovering scale. So now you're moving in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the world. The scene's being mapped as you move around. It's very low latency. But now we do something extra cool. This wasn't enough, so we started to reconstruct the environment. So we're building a map, essentially the geometry of the environment around you. We're localizing it fairly accurately, or very accurately, in order to provide you with clues of where the obstacles are in your environment. A point cloud doesn't really do this, is what we experienced. But these lines actually start to give you the intuition about where the obstacles are in your environment. And of course, from here, we can drop you into VR. And we can let you control your scene, like in any VR system. Just like you're using Lighthouse or you're using you know, the constellation tracking from Oculus. But we can also make you aware of obstacles when you need to be made aware of them when they get close to you. So yeah, so that's our new tracking. And it's, thank you. And you can go to that URL. It went live an hour ago. Uh, check it out. I'll have it at the end, so you don't need to write it down yet. But you might be wondering a few things about this. Is this just made up? Is this, you know, is there, is this fake? Were you using Lighthouse? Um, so uh, you might be wondering, how accurate is it? So we've been starting to do some tests. And accuracy is a really challenging thing to figure out, because you have to test all these crazy conditions. There isn't one answer to accuracy in our view. You have to test a lot of different stuff. But we did a test, a random test in a, in a, you know, a room-scale environment. We moved around. And here was one of the results that we got, a sort of randomly chosen result. Uh, on the chart on the left, there's actually six lines. You can only really see three of them, because Lighthouse and occipital tracking are on top of each other, uh, very close. And we measured accuracy in this one room-scale test over about a minute. And we got 8.5 millimeters of RMSE accuracy um, and about a half a degree of, of RMSE rotational uh, inaccuracy, uh, including one global scale correction. So it's very accurate. Um, and we're still working on it. It's going to be constantly improving. 
So it's accurate in some cases, but is it robust? And so this is something we're, you know, everybody's working on, making it better. But let's see what happens when the system is faced with blank walls. And frankly, it can fail. So too blank, doesn't know, and it snaps back and starts tracking. So you can see it is imperfect. These are challenging cases. How does it handle fast movements? So it handles fast movements pretty well. Um, still has some trouble with really blank walls and things like that. We're doing what we can, but with one camera, there is some limit to how good you can actually do. And lastly, uh, how do we handle things like occlusions, things blocking the view? We'll check that out. So total occlusion, we, we of course do lose track and we don't know what happened in that case. We could do some IMU extrapolation at that point, but it can be risky. So that's flexible tracking, it's really stable. We're excited about it. And in, in testing, we didn't think this was gonna be the case, frankly. We, we, we said, how far can we push the cost down of positional tracking, you know, along the way maybe making less need to actually buy stuff from us, which, you know, is questionably good business. But um, remarkably, this tracking is feeling as good or better than our RGBD tracking using much more complicated uh, systems, a more complicated setup, more expense. Um, it doesn't mean it's always as good, it doesn't mean it always performs better, but it is starting to perform really, really well. So, we have a system that's sixed off, you know, it can track your position. It's scale accurate, even though it only has one camera. It actually knows one-to-one -one correspondence scale with the world, and what's a really new feature is it also provides obstacle awareness with just a monocular camera. One camera, no depth, no nothing and we can provide you obstacle awareness. So, how much are we gonna charge for it? Uh, what's it gonna cost? Because you, know, you gotta build in the cameras, but you gotta pay some software license fee uh, to us. And so we're also announcing some pricing today for this new system. Uh, so for 10 to 100,000 uh, uh, unit deployments, we're gonna charge $10 per device, and that's it, just an all-inclusive license fee. If your product hits a really high volume, like 100K plus, like some of the more popular VR devices, at the consumer level, we're going to charge $7 per device, and that's it. Um, and one of the things we struggled with is what do we do at the low end when it's a new product being introduced to the market? We don't know how many units it's going to sell at all. Um, and we're actually, we could charge a lot, we could charge a little, we're actually going to charge nothing uh, for the low end. So you can build positional tracking into your device, um, and up your first 10,000 units, you don't have to pay us anything. You do have to buy your cameras. We can help you, you can buy them on your own. Um, but that's how we're going to price this thing. So our basic positional tracking software in a monocular configuration, a stereo configuration, are going to be free up to 10,000 units. And we think very reasonably priced above that. Uh, for devices that are very expensive, that are in the expensive sort of non-consumer category, um, we're charging, our current pricing is 3% uh, of the MSRP of the device. It's available for uh, Windows, uh, right now, we're going to demo that here at the show, and Android is very, very close uh, on the heels of that. So, so that's our offering. And uh, so, in, in other words, uh, this new system is uh, lower cost, it's smaller, it has fewer parts. Um, hopefully it won't break as much because it doesn't have as many parts, and it costs you less. So maybe uh, this will be a huge success, just like the Corolla. We'll see. So, but you know, you might be wondering, you know, at Occipital we build this hardware, we do RGBD stuff. Uh, was there any need for any of that stuff? What about systems that actually can afford the inclusion of more sophisticated sensing? Um, well, there are still cool things you can do when you can add better and more sophisticated sensing. Uh, for one, you can build a dense map of your environment, which we have a very hard time doing with a single monocular camera. So you can have a dense map of everything in the scene, which you can use for things like occlusion, you can use for things like accurate physics, and you can create mixed reality or augmented reality experiences that are very immersive like this. This is an old demo that we just uh, announced a couple years ago. And um, earlier this year we announced that headset for iPhone 
which is actually available today. You can actually go purchase it from bridge.occipital.com and you can develop mixed reality apps using an iPhone. Let's check out some of the cool things you can do with Bridge, which has an RGBD sensor. Now this is a CG, but this is real footage. So you can do cool things like, you know, densely map the world. You can, you can scan spaces and you know create these uh, portals between different real world spaces. You can uh, simulate physics or have real things and virtual things actually intersecting with each other, which is important for realism. So this is what you can do with more sophisticated sensing um, if the monocular thing you know isn't right for you. And even beyond some of the stuff that we're doing, there's more you can do with dense, sensor, uh, dense sensing, more sophisticated sensing. So here's some research uh, that's you know, in the last couple of years. So one thing that people are going to want to start to do is to actually understand semantically what are the things around you, not just where are you, but what are the things around you. So this first video is by um, uh, Julian Valentine and others. And basically, you can use these gestures to tag an object and then that object will be essentially uh, marked up and then to be fed into a machine learning algorithm to remember these types of objects. So the system could say in the future, that's a chair, that's a table, that's the ground, that's a banana, that sort of stuff. And then if, also if you have dense sensing, it makes it much easier to do even more sophisticated reconstructions where you're actually reconstructing things as they move. So here this plush toy and this other research project is being reconstructed live. Again, this is just some research of what can you do with more sophisticated sensing. So what sensing should you use for your application? If you're building a VR headset, you definitely can get by with stereo sensing or RGBD sensing. And I think as of today, or, or near, near as of today, you can also get by with monocular sensing, uh, which really brings the cost down for positional tracking on VR devices. If you're doing headsets for AR and MR, that's where I really think you need the dense map of the world. You need to know more so what things are rather than just where they are. And you may want RGBD sensing, like what the HoloLens has. You might be able to get by with stereo. I think that's an interesting open question. But I don't think monocular is right, at least at this point, for that application. So is positional tracking going to be commoditized? This is one of the things that people say to us all the time. Why are you guys working on that? Isn't it just going to be commoditized? Well, cheap positional tracking with one camera, two cameras, we do think it's going to be commoditized. The price is going to be dropped really low. You're going to be able to use it very widely on just about every device. But this problem is far from solved because we still have a lot, of more, a lot more to solve. We have to do artificial intelligence. We need to understand the scene. We need to build dense maps. There's going to be a lot of work for a lot of years in computer vision to pull the rest of this stuff off. That's not going to be commoditized anytime soon. And a lot of people today are scrambling to find positional tracking for their solution because you know, they have to compete with the, the incumbents in VR. Um, but I think a year or two from now, people are going to be scrambling to figure out how to give more intelligence to their vision system on board their device. So that's how we think commoditization is going to proceed from here. So thanks for checking out the talk. I really appreciate everybody coming. And I would love to take some questions. OK, so I will read these anonymous questions. So how robust is occipital tracking dr against drift, and does this differ by device? So one thing of note is occipital tracking is uh, basically you know, using, it depends on the camera. So we're not really offering it necessarily for everybody's smartphone at this point in time, although maybe that's possible. Um, so you're really going to be picking your camera and you know, making sure that it's tweaked for the tracking algorithms. But how robust is it against drift? It basically doesn't drift as long as it can lock onto the scene. More or less, that's the answer. It's not a system that drifts. So that makes it different fundamentally from visual odometry systems where they drift when you're moving around. The system doesn't. What it could do is instead lose track entirely and need you to essentially reinitialize it. But if it never loses track, it will essentially never drift, only very small uh, positional errors. Uh, OK, let's see. <clears throat> How
how are you getting scale? Let's talk about that one. You said it's monocular. How is scale generated? Seems like there is some post-processing. Uh, we actually estimated scale in about the first three seconds. So the way that works is the system is doing a very tight fusion between the IMU and the camera. The IMU is actually outputting data in a real-world scale reference space. The accelerometer is in meters per second squared. So if you double integrate that, you essentially get position. Now that's super noisy, and so you have to be very careful when you try to do that. But if you do it carefully, you actually can recover scale from an IMU, provided it's good enough quality and your, your algorithms are sophisticated enough. So this system is actually recovering scale by itself from the IMU signal. Um, let's see. Will you be bringing your mono tracking to your iOS SDK? Uh, the answer there is we haven't decided. So if you have a very good use case for that and you're excited about it, let us know. One thing I will say is if you use our bridge device, you actually can track against a scene that was captured with RGBD with just a mono camera. But you can't capture scenes with a mono camera. So let us know if you're interested in that. Um, let's see. Performance scanning metal or thin objects. If the thin objects are you know, have sharp lines, that actually works pretty well. Metal surfaces are always tricky. We haven't really done a lot of testing with this new system. I think it will generally reject really confusing glossy things and won't have too much problems. Um, will there be a Unity plugin? Um, that's a good question. Let us know if you're interested in that. We have Unity plugins for some of our stuff already, like Bridge and Structure Sensor. Um, this tracking is really geared towards people building devices. So the question is probably, are they going to have a Unity plugin for their device? Um, but we're happy to integrate with that kind of thing. Uh, what is the range you can track? Room scale, 10, 20, 50 meters. Um, we've tried it in you know, 5 to 10 meter rooms at this point. We haven't really pushed to see what happens in a 100 meter room or something like that. It, there, it will be challenging if, you, if there's nothing nearby. I mean, visual tracking when there's literally nothing to look at is really hard, which is why for very robust systems, you probably want to add more cameras. Um, but if the user knows what they're doing, to even a little extent, they can have a great experience with just a monocular camera. Let's see. Um, will CNNs make stereo depth cameras redundant? That's pretty interesting. Uh, I think the answer is, uh, I think that's a hard one to answer. I think the answer is no, because with, uh, because CNNs are always uh, only up to a scale. I'm sorry, they, they don't, they can't really recover scale. They're sort of guessing at scale, and so you're going to need some tight fusion between either IMU and camera, or you're going to need stereo to, to really get scale. Otherwise, you're just going to be making mistakes all the time. So. By the way, if anybody's curious what that question is about, it's, it's basically about, you know, we have these depth cameras where they have stereo cameras or structured light cameras. Um, and there's some new research results where people are just taking one camera and feeding it into a CNN, and it somehow is coming up with depth, which is kind of crazy and weird. Um, but it's just memorizing things that it's seen before. It's kind of like I've seen something that looks like that chair before, and I know how far away it was at the time. And so it memorizes that. Um, but it's, it's inherently you know, a guess, basically. So, all right, what else? Um, what's the mono tracking's performance in, in dynamic scenes, such as shadow reflection, dynamic objects? It does a very good job rejecting these things. We had the one example of waving your hands in front of the system. Uh, it really handled that pretty well. If you start to move things that it was using as, you know, feature points, it could be confused. So there's work to do there to handle really long duration environments. Um, let's see. Does this work as a software only solution on phones with wide angle camera and IMU? What calibration is necessary? Uh, that's a good question. It could work on a, on a phone with wide angle camera. It could even work without a wide angle camera. You do have to have a good camera calibration. Um, and that's pretty much it. Camera calibration, you need to know where the IMU is in your system which isn't that hard. Um, plane extraction from line segments, not yet, maybe later. And how much more time do we have? You have three more days, but in okay. 10 more minutes. Okay. The, uh, 
I really like audience questions the old-fashioned way. Right, same, same. Right? Um, so uh, how good is the performance outdoor? How stable with people walking around? So it's pretty stable with people walking around, um, similar to you know, blinding the system with your hand. Uh, outdoors, it should perform quite well, but you're going to have an issue at some point with your map getting really huge. And that's going to start to use a lot of RAM, and we haven't really tried to handle like walking down a city street. So really, this is targeted for uh, can we provide tracking that feels as good as something like Lighthouse or Oculus, uh, but with just one camera. You know, you know Jeff, so for you, um, yeah. tackle any of those other ones that you want. Yep. But since we aim to please in this room for our speakers, um, are there any questions from the audience? And I'll do a Donahue run around. Yeah, that would be fun. Real quick. So, um, Actual audience questions. Come on, man. Somebody type that up here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of came in late, so it's a content really. Um, sorry. There's a pass through feature. Oh, sorry. So there's a pass through feature yeah. on um, Gear VR, Oculus yeah. Rift. Uh, so would this be able to kind of merge AR into that if you, if you were able to produce with like a Galaxy smartphone camera? Yeah, so uh, if you try to do pass through uh, AR, mixed reality type experience. The big issue is if you don't have dense depth everywhere in the scene, you can't give the user a nice 3D experience. So like they're wearing a headset, but they might as well be looking at a screen. And so uh, we can you know, generate a point cloud around them and you know, they can sort of see the scene and have things dropped in it, but you don't get that camera backplate. If you try to, it won't be 3D. So that's, you really need to go to stereo cameras to pull that off. I'm wondering, why is it that, um, you, you, I noticed you said this is good for present tracking for VR, but it's not good for AR, the, the mono, the mono uh, tracking system. Why is that? So the answer to that is actually, uh, to be a little more specific, I think it's not good for AR where you need to do uh, occlusions with the real world, real world objects. So if you want to have characters running amongst and behind things, you probably want a dense map. And so I you know, our opinion is that for that type of device, you probably want some dense depth, which is probably why the HoloLens has dense depth. If you're doing uh, AR um, where you don't necessarily care about those sorts of things, it could be just fine. If you're more focused on locking the environment and flo having things floating and you don't care as much about occlusion and stuff, I think it could work well. Yeah. What is the processing requirement for the algorithm? Uh, so the processing is, so right now we're running it on a, on a Windows computer. We're using a fraction of a core. I don't have the exact number. Um, it will run with a, you know, a very small fraction of a modern ARM core, but we're still optimizing it. We rushed to get a really great experience for the show, and then now we'll start to optimize it for uh, all the mobile devices out there. Does it support uh, relocalization and loop closure? Uh, yeah, it supports those things to, to varying degrees. Um, you saw when the system was blinded, it snapped back to where it was. We have other software that can relocalize in a pretty larger environment, which we haven't integrated into this demo yet, but it, it can totally be integrated pretty easily. Thanks. Um, what's the best way to get a dense uh, depth estimation for objects at a distance larger than a depth camera can uh, perceive? Uh, for really long distances, if you have the budget and size, I would use LiDAR probably for that kind of a system. But no way to do it on a, uh, a camera device without uh, a CNN. I, you know, you can, you, can make, you can hallucinate it with a CNN, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, maybe reasonably compelling to, to do it that way. And if you're just doing AR and you need occlusions, it probably could work. Yeah. Hey. Um, Anything on the roadmap for controller tracking or hand tracking or anything like that? So nothing I can say about that. There are some really cool companies, you know, like Leap Motion and others working on uh, hand tracking. There's, there's Node that's working on controller tracking. Um, uh, we can integrate with all those guys. But nothing I can talk about that, that we're working on right now. Any other old school questions? Or the old school way, at least. All right, well, if you, uh, it's, it's up to you then, speaker, if you want to tackle a couple more of those up okay. there, or if you want to. Yeah, I'll it. do a couple more, right. and then we can wrap up, and you guys can find me. I, I want th one important thing I do want to mention, over in room 212, uh, which is literally right, right across here, we're going to be able to take sign-ups. So 
if anybody wants to come check out our demo, it's not uh, running today, but it's running tomorrow. You guys should be the first to go sign up and, and get a slot. It's their private demos, but for anybody that wants to sign up. So come by and sign up. Um, that's just in room 212, right in the, right in the hallway. One more question there? Um, yeah, is there some information online about uh, monocular tracking? Yeah, so go to occipital.com slash tracking. And that's our brand new web page that talks all about it. You can sign up, get some info. You can even buy a dev kit that uses our structure core if you want to get started earlier. So, all right, well, let me see if there's any last cool ones here. Uh, what's on the roadmap for mono tracking specifically? Uh, it's going to be amazing a year from now, I'll say that. <laughs> um, cool, well, I think we'll stop there, and you guys can get a few more extra minutes before your next meeting. Appreciate everybody coming. Uh, Find me after, go sign up if you want to check out a demo. And thank you guys. Big round of applause, please.